Within this week's video, I'm going to show you the techniques that I use to paint water, waves, and reflections in that water. Last week, we finished up painting in the sky for this landscape, and we'll pick it up from where we left off. That'll be right here on the horizon line. We'll start from the water in the background and move up to the foreground. In my airbrush right now, I have the same color that I use for the blue in the sky, which is an equal parts mixture of Payne's gray and cobalt blue. This is going to be a transparent color, and since the water is going to be reflecting the sky, it's going to need to be the same color. I'm starting out with a piece of paper, lining this up with the horizon. That's going to give me that straight line, and then I'm spraying below it. There was a small amount of yellow paint here, which was over spray from when I was painting in the sun. So you'll notice here that when I paint on this blue, this is going to look a little bit green. That's because the blue and the yellow are mixing, giving a green color. Now this isn't going to be much of a problem here since I could blend this greenish hue into the blue by erasing into it later on and then spraying some more of this blue paint over the top. But I think that this just goes to show how much of a small amount of overspray can shift the color or the value of the paint that you're spraying over the top, especially when you're using a fully transparent color. This isn't going to be much of a problem here because this is the ocean and even if some parts of it are a little bit green, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But if that green color was in the sky, it would look very strange and something that you'd have to spend a good amount of time fixing. It's just very important to always be aware of overspray and just how it's going to affect other parts of the painting that you're working on. I'll always do the best I can to try to minimize some of the negative effects of overspray, but just understand that it's always going to be part of painting with an airbrush and something that you're going to always have to deal with. The first major thing that I want to add into this water is this wave, which is kind of far away back in the distance, so there's not going to be too much detail in it. What I'm doing here is using a ripped piece of paper just to paint in the top and the bottom of the wave. The purpose of spraying over the paper is just to kind of get my bearings of where this wave is going to be. I'll switch over to my eraser and what I'll do here is start working on the smallest wave in the background. Because of perspective or linear perspective, objects in the distance are obviously going to need to be smaller. And not only smaller, they're also going to need to be less detailed just because they're farther away. And because the sun is above them, the highlights on each wave are obviously going to be on the top. So I'm just erasing out some paint on the top of each one of these shadows. And it's not like I'm actually thinking about painting a wave here. I'm just looking at the reference, noticing where the darks and shadows are. And the goal is just to give the illusion or the impression that there's a wave or just something going on in the distance. So erasing out the highlights first, if anything gets a bit too light from that eraser, I could just use my airbrush to spray some of this blue right back over the top. If you look at my completed painting on the left side of the screen, you'll notice that there's this very small little rock here just above this wave. So I just used the blue that was in my airbrush to spray it in with a shield. That way I have a reference point. I know where that rock is going to be, and I know where the wave, the highlights, and shadows of it are going to be underneath it. If you look at my completed painting and you pay attention to this wave, you'll notice that it's just a bunch of light and dark values next to each other. So what I'm doing here is very simple. As I'm looking at the reference, if I notice an area is a bit darker, I just spray some more paint in freehand. These darker areas are going to end up looking like some shadows within the wave. Toward the base of the wave, there's just some areas of some blue and some darker blue. And then as you look up toward the top of the wave where the light's hitting it, you have some really bright areas, almost some white. And I'll add those in in a minute or so, but what I want to do now is since I have that wave in, I notice that the area just behind it, this part of the ocean, is still a bit too light. So I'll take this blue color and just start glazing it over this area. Just a thin amount of paint to help darken that area up. This is something that I'm always doing and thinking about when I'm painting. Once I start working on a new part of a painting, adding in some highlights and some shadows, I'll always use it to compare to the previous part of the painting that I was just working on. And then I'll just look at the two parts together and compare them, because when I'm painting, I'm always working on one part of a painting at a time. But each one of those small parts has to come together to give you one final painting, because that's the way that the viewer is going to see it. And this is just a great trick to not get overwhelmed in a painting. Sometimes when you're looking at the reference, there's just too much stuff. And when you're looking at all that stuff, thinking that I have to paint all this and get all this in, it just becomes overwhelming. You're just going to think you can't do it because it's impossible to do in one shot. You really have to break it down. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. The main thing I'm working on is this one wave, but I notice that the area behind it needs to be adjusted. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm just using my eraser to erase into this, pull out some highlights toward the left where the sun is hitting it, and just trying to get a subtle gradient in there from brighter on the left where the sun is to a bit darker over to the right. So at this point, that's good enough for now. I'll definitely come back to this again later, 
but let's move along to this wave and start adding in some of these bright highlights. What I'll do here is use my electric eraser to start pulling out some of this paint. And all I'm doing with this is just tapping it to the canvas, pulling out some small dots. I'm erasing out all the paint with this because an electric eraser is very aggressive and these highlights are gonna be pure white. The goal here is to get a bunch of these small highlights together to make it look like these highlights are some of that sea foam that you see when waves are crashing. And like I said before, once I add some part of the painting in, I'm comparing it. So I added in those highlights and that helped me to see that the area below the wave needs to be a bit darker. So I'm using a shield, a ripped piece of paper, and just spraying a bit of paint there to help darken it up. These small areas of white are the highlights and remember that every highlight is always going to have a shadow. So I'll use the airbrush freehand just to spray some shadows underneath each one of these highlights. And I'm not going for any crazy detail or anything like this. This wave is really far away. Most people aren't even going to notice it. All I want to do is get those lights and darks in the correct places to give the illusion of the wave. I'll work my way from the left side over to the right side of this wave using both erasers, the stick eraser and then the electric one just to get in those really bright dots on top. This whole time I'm sticking with that one color which is the mixture of Payne's gray and cobalt blue. I'm going to use that for like 95% of this water. Once the highlights are in with the eraser, I use the airbrush to spray the shadows in underneath. And then I'll take this blue color and just kind of glaze it over the wave and the area down below it. This will give me some paint on the canvas to work into so I could erase into it and pull out the highlights where I see them. At this point, this probably doesn't look like much of a wave yet, but we'll get there. We just have to keep building this up. So let me go back over to that electric eraser and start adding out some more of these bright highlights, this foam on top of the wave on the right here. And of course those highlights need shadows, so I'll use my airbrush to freehand spray in some paint right underneath. I'll also use my stick eraser to pull out some of those lines, like some of those lines of foam that you see going up the wave. As I start working my way forward toward the foreground, there's going to be a lot of shifts here between very sharp bright areas and then very sharp dark areas. So what I'm doing here is using a ripped piece of paper, spraying over that as a shield to give me some of those sharp lines, so sharp dark lines. Those will be the shadows of some of the smaller waves in front of the larger one. And those smaller waves also need the highlights with those shadows. So I'll use my electric eraser and my stick eraser here. And then I'll just pull out some paint above each one of these shadows. This is one of the keys to getting the illusion of water or waves to start coming together. It's about dark right next to light. A few months ago on this channel we painted a small still life of a hammer and one of a wrench. The goal of both of those was to show that reflective effect. How do you get something to look like metal? And if you watch the hammer one, one thing that I mentioned in it is that painting reflections, painting something so that it looks metal or metallic, is very similar to the way that you paint water or something that's wet. It's all about that very high contrast of values, very dark darks right next to very bright highlights. So just jumping ahead, that's what this part of the painting is going to look like later on. If you look at it, you'll see a bunch of bands of horizontal lines, a very bright right next to very dark. And they're always right next to each other, which is going to give off the illusion of reflections. And water, just like metal, is highly reflective and it's going to reflect that light. So even though water and metal are two completely different things and they don't look similar at all, the techniques used for painting them, or painting the illusion of them, is very, very similar. So just keep that concept or that idea in mind as we go back to this painting and continue along. Over on the right side of this large wave, I'll use my electric eraser again, just to tap out some bright dots on the top of the wave. And then for the shadows underneath those highlights, I notice this one has a sharper line where the bottom of the wave is, so I'm using a ripped piece of paper. And then for some of those softer shadows, I'll just paint them in freehand. Now that most of that wave is painted in, I'm looking at the area that I completed before, the water in the background. I noticed that it definitely needed some highlights, so I'll use my eraser just to erase out some thin bands of white. And you'll notice here that this is starting to look like water. We're getting that effect that this looks like a larger wave and then the ocean behind it. And the key to this is that high contrast, those bright highlights erased out with the eraser, and then some of those dark shadows and dark bands around them. So let's just continue along with that idea. I'll use a ripped piece of paper here to spray in a few of the shadows for the smaller waves which are going to be in front. These will probably need to be a bit darker later on, but for now let's just get them in place. Once those are in, that's going to be one part of the illusion. The next part is the highlights. So I'll use my electric eraser to start erasing these out in between those shadows. I'm always thinking about where the light source is. Obviously on this one it's the sun right behind it. So these highlights are going to need to be on top, above each one of those shadows. And from here, I know that I'll be working on this area just below it, so I'll use the airbrush to just glaze some of this blue paint. 
I want to spray a small amount of this to cover up some of that white gesso and also to have something to erase into. If you look at the reference, there's obviously a bunch of rocks in between this water. So at this point, I want to start adding those in. For now, all I want to do is get them in place. I'm starting with a few of these very small rocks in the background, and I'm using a ripped piece of paper for this. I'm spraying over a ripped piece of paper so the texture from it gets transferred over to the canvas. The color in my airbrush is a mixture of 50% black with 50% Payne's Gray. The only reason that I added the Payne's Gray is that it'll make that black paint a bit easier to erase. And so the color for the rocks here is also going to be a transparent color. And it's very, very important that I don't spray too much of it here. One thing about landscapes is that objects in the distance are always going to be a bit softer and have less contrast than anything close to you in the foreground. An extreme version of this idea would be something like a foggy day, and we all know what that looks like. Objects that are far away are difficult, if not impossible, to see. But on a normal, clear day, the atmosphere is still going to distort things in the background, so they're not going to be as detailed, and they're not going to be as dark. And that's going to be the case with this painting. Everything that's far away, I'm just going to make a bit softer and a bit lighter. I'll build up the detail and the contrast as I move up toward the foreground. So as I'm painting in these rocks, if I accidentally spray some of them a bit too dark, like I did with some of the ones in the background, all I need to do is use my stick eraser and just make a pass over the top, and that'll help lighten it. So let's start adding some of these waves closer to this larger rock right in the center. You can see I painted in that black line there, and then just above it I'm adding in a few horizontal bands of pure white, just erasing out all the paint. So I have those two highlights in here, now right in between I need to darken this area up, because we need really bright next to really dark. So I'll go back over to this blue color mixture, use a shield, and spray right in between them to darken it up. And what I'm going to do from here is continue that technique straight down. You can see that my pencil lines are here, that's from my initial drawing, and what those lines are telling me are where the shadows and where the highlights are going to be, so I'm just basically following those. And you could do this either way, you could start by adding in the shadows first, adding in the highlights first, it really doesn't matter. As long as you have them both in there and next to each other, the effect will start to come together. For the rocks and the cliffs on the left side, I just want to get those in place, so I'll use some frisket film here, and then go back over to that rock color mixture. I'll add in the texture and the highlights to these rocks later on, but for now I want them in place. The reason for this is because they're going to be casting some reflections just below them in the water. And I'll just continue with the same color of paint that I used to paint in the rocks for some of these shadows in the waves here. These shadows are going to be a little bit closer to us than the ones in the background, so I'm going to make these darker. And this dark paint is also going to help build up the contrast in the waves so that those thin bands of highlights, those bright areas on the waves, are even going to look brighter. The only way for something to look bright in a painting is to have a dark area next to it. So I'll continue using this dark paint to paint in these shadows for some of these closer waves. And also I'll spray a good amount of this blue paint over this area, that way it's nice and dark so when I erase these highlights are going to look a lot brighter. And if you erase these out, I definitely recommend using the electric eraser over a stick eraser, because that's going to pull out more paint and keep them brighter. I also want to make sure that this rock is casting a reflection in the water. So all I did was paint the basic shape of the rock again using a shield, just getting the left and the right side in. And then within that reflection, I did the same thing by adding highlights and shadows, only this time keeping everything a lot darker. And when you look at that from a distance, it looks like a rock with a reflection within the water. And from here, it's like what I do in all my paintings, I just continually build it up. I keep adding paint with the airbrush, making the shadows darker, glazing some of the paint over the highlights, and then of course coming back to the eraser again, removing some more highlights and making some of them brighter. It's all about just building up layers and building up the contrast. So I do hope that this tutorial was helpful to some of you out there trying to paint water. But before I go, I just want to show you a painting that always seems to haunt me every time I paint water. And I mean that in the best, most loving way possible. It's this painting called La Granuaire by Claude Monet. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. I probably first saw this painting 20, 25 years ago, and it's stuck with me ever since. And I know that I definitely talked about this painting on the channel before. But in this one, Monet took the technique of painting water like what I talked about, using that extremely high contrasted values of dark and light, by placing them right next to each other. But what Monet did with this painting is incredible because he simplified it so much by breaking everything down into the absolute essentials. 
painting only what was needed, dark lines at a single brush strokes right next to light lines, and then a few brush strokes of green thrown in there to show the tree reflections. So up close it actually looks pretty simple, but then when you stand back and see the painting as a whole, everything is there. And over the last two decades, any time that I paint water or paint a landscape with water in it, this painting always seems to pop up in my head and I have to go see it again. It's honestly one of my favorite water paintings of all time and if you're ever in New York, make sure you go to the Met and check this one out. I hope that this video was helpful and thank you so much for watching. And thank you so much the incredible, kind, and generous support from the channel members scrolling up on the right side of the screen. We'll be continuing the rest of this painting up on the members page, so I'll see you guys there.